Before I begin, I want to address those who have clicked on this video that might not have watched the original Ghost in the Shell. Aside from maybe Akira, Ghost in the Shell is arguably the most celebrated film in the realm of Japanese anime, and for good reason. If you have not seen it, please stop this video and go watch it. Not only is it less than 90 minutes long, it manages to contain more spectacle and story in that runtime than some franchises do in an entire series. If it weren't for Ghost in the Shell, there would have never been movies like The Matrix or Avatar, or games such as the hotly anticipated Cyberpunk 2077. Hopefully these objective realities are enough to convince you to go watch it. Now, to address those who have seen Ghost in the Shell, I have wanted to do a video on this movie for about three years now. I tend to refrain from doing videos on popular franchises unless I can provide an original perspective. Thankfully, I believe I can offer some unique insight into this property. As I re-examine some of the film's most profound moments, I intend to shine greater light on the mythological and psychological subtext of these moments. While we will, of course, ruminate on the questions this film asks, I will also try to determine where these questions came from in the first place. By tracing these questions to their origin, I intend to enhance our collective understanding of this film themes and their implications for our reality. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. Any discussion surrounding Ghost in the Shell starts and ends with Motoko's identity crisis. Major Motoko Kusanagi is a cyborg, specifically constructed to appear human to any superficial observer. This indistinguishability was achieved via the scanning of real human body parts. By understanding how human body parts function down to the molecular level, a perfect artificial copy could be produced. For example, Matoko's brain is indistinguishable from a human brain on a purely functional level, with one major exception. Her brain is augmented in such a way that she can access digital networks through holes in the back of her neck, a la The Matrix. Aside from that, Matoko's brain and other cyber brains like hers are perfect copies of human brains. For anybody that has followed my channel for the past year, this concept might seem familiar. I did an analysis of two different video games that both address the human-slash-robot dichotomy, Soma and the Talos Principle. The stories of both games question how special human consciousness really is if, theoretically, it can be reproduced with artificial components. This possibility of replicating human consciousness challenges the existence of what we tend to call the soul, the part of ourselves that is supposed to confer our transcendent value, the part of us that is supposed to live on after death. The possibility of the soul's non-existence, or its banality, is a horror that both games exploit. Ghost in the Shell takes that existential horror and forces it almost entirely upon the character of Matoko. The fact that her brain was constructed by scanning a human brain creates an endless stream of philosophical questions. Most notably, it's the question of whether or not Matoko is her own person, a true individual. In the world of the movie, it is immediately assumed that because the cyborg has no link to the natural world, it does not actually have a soul, or for the purposes of this discussion, a ghost. Any semblance of a ghost that a cyborg might feel is supposedly an illusion. But is this true? Well, the film does not offer any definitive answers, but it certainly offers its share of powerful arguments. In regards to the character of Bato, he perceives Matoko's existential angst as needless. He seems to believe that if a being has the ability to think, the ability to doubt, then that should be enough to put Matoko's mind at ease. This echoes the famous philosophical maxim of René Descartes, I think, therefore I am. What this means is that even if all other aspects of one's life are an illusion, the mere ability to think is enough to indicate that a person actually exists. Bato seems to think this goes for Matoko as well. Even if her brain was copied from someone else, the fact that she has the capacity to think for herself is enough to confirm her existence as a unique, sentient being. 
The fact that she made her own choices and can reflect on those choices as memories should confirm her uniqueness. It's a decent argument, but nonetheless, it's one that the film argues against. The most obvious challenge to the I think therefore I am maxim comes at the end of the diving scene. While Matoko and Bato are philosophizing on the nature of being, a voice that sounds very much like Matoko's begins to speak. What we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Note that these words weren't spoken out loud by Matoko, but are heard internally via the network both of their cyberbrains share. Bato then questions whether or not Matoko said this herself, but before she can reply, the film cuts to the next scene. What this scene suggests is the possibility that the thought expressed in the voice of Matoko did not come about via her own choice. Rather, the thought came about itself. This challenges Descartes' belief. Maybe it isn't the person that actually thinks. Maybe, in fact, it is something else. This critique of Descartes' maxim is not unique to Ghost in the Shell. In fact, it was made hundreds of years earlier by the famous German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. In his masterwork, Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche indirectly challenges Descartes' immediate certainty that it is the person, the ego, that thinks. Quote, from whence did I get the notion of thinking? What gives me the right to speak of an ego and even of an ego as cause? And finally, of an ego as cause of thought? To use simpler terms, Nietzsche is suggesting one of two things. One, instead of believing that a person is responsible for thinking, one should assume instead that the mere act of thinking is occurring without a knowable cause. Two, that the thought came to a person from a different source. This belief was further expanded upon by another famous thinker, one who was heavily influenced by Nietzsche, Carl Jung. In his work titled Structure and Dynamics of the Psyche, Jung says the following, Everyone knows nowadays that people have complexes. What is not so well known, though far more important theoretically, is that complexes can have us. For those of you that might be having trouble with this concept, think of it this way. Imagine somebody betrays you in the most devastating way, and you have a desire to seek revenge. Did you think up the idea for revenge, or did the idea for revenge come to you as an instinct? In other words, did you have the idea, or did the idea have you? If it's the latter, then maybe your ability to think doesn't necessarily confirm your individuality. Maybe Descartes was wrong. Maybe. The fact that Matoko appears to be thinking isn't enough to confirm her own existence as an individual, as somebody who has a ghost. This conundrum is expanded upon with the issue of memories. Memories supposedly confirm one's individuality, one's ghost. The memories you have are unique to you, that came about via experiences that are unique to your life, supposedly. Yet again, this idea is challenged not only by Ghost in the Shell, but by many works that have come before. In the world of Ghost in the Shell, the possibility of implanting memories is real, most notably in the case of the Garbage Man. His thoughts and memories are not his. They were implanted by the villain known as the Puppet Master. Before we continue, let us take a breath and summarize what has been discussed so far. The world of Ghost in the Shell offers a potential vision of our future, where human brains can not only be augmented, but replicated artificially. The possibility of augmenting and replicating human brains introduces terrifying possibilities, not just for the world of Ghost in the Shell, but our reality. Namely, the possibility that the things which are supposed to confirm the existence of our souls, our thoughts and memories, can be controlled and manipulated. The reason why the film is presenting us with these frightening possibilities is to force us to confront the following uncomfortable truth. If artificial brains, human brains, and augmented brains can have their thoughts and memories manipulated, the very things that are supposed to make us who we are, then this suggests that the soul might not exist at all. Or, to use the words of a fellow YouTuber, Loco Steve, there is no ghost in the shell. The prejudice that only humans can have souls is just that, 
The Prejudice. We are very similar to these fictional cyborgs, not just in this way, but many others. Where robotic consciousness is a series of zeros and ones, human consciousness is a series of DNA strands. Where digital life grew out of the sea of information known as the internet, a la the puppet master, organic life grew out of the oceans four billion years ago. The notion that the soul might not actually exist can be upsetting to some that we might not have this transcendent special element in all of us. But keep in mind, the film does offer a potential solution to not just Matoko's existential anxiety, but our own. At the end of the film, Matoko battles with a large Tachikoma tank in an abandoned building. During the fight, the gunfire from the tank damages a mural on the wall. The mural is a depiction of the Tree of Life, a religious symbol that spans across many cultures. As pointed out by another YouTuber named Anime Every Day in his video titled Matoko's Dilemma, the damaging of the Tree of Life is symbolic of life moving on from evolution into a higher level of existence in the sea of information. The higher level he refers to is the solution to Matoko's existential anxiety. By merging her consciousness with that of the puppet master, they will birth the seed that will give rise to a higher consciousness. One that is neither purely human or digital, but a combination of the two. While one will rightly see the atheistic symbolism in the movie, for example with the shooting of the Tree of Life and the arguments against the ghost concept, there is also a certain respect given to religious tradition. I would like to cite the work of Eric Neumann, a scholar of psychology and religion. In his book titled The Origins and History of Consciousness, Neumann notes how a living being achieves higher levels of consciousness, quote, to discriminate, to distinguish, to mark off, to isolate oneself from the surrounding context. These are the basic acts of consciousness. In other words, it is only by questioning what came before, by challenging the established order, that something new may follow. For example, if God never said, let there be light in the Judeo-Christian tradition, all that would exist is chaotic nothingness, or as the ancient Greeks called it, the Ouroboros. If the Babylonian god Marduk never killed the goddess of primordial chaos, Tiamat, then he would have not created the heavens and the earth from her body. The shooting of the tree represents Matoko and the puppet master isolating themselves from the normal processes of evolution and creating a higher state of being. So, what is this higher state of being? In alchemical tradition, it is from the conflicting of light and darkness, the most ancient of opposite elements, that all creation followed. In the mind of the alchemists, the aforementioned Jung, and many religions, the central goal of life is to bring all opposite elements, without and within, into a perfect, balanced union. This union is symbolized in many ways, but in regards to Ghost in the Shell, this union is symbolized by the Tree of Life, as well as the merge between Matoko and the Puppet Master. According to Mircea Eliad and Gilbert Durand, the tree is a symbol of the totality of the cosmos in its genesis and its becoming, the union of opposites the synthesis of the sexes. The merging of Matoko and the Puppet Master symbolizes this perfect union of opposites between man and woman, hero and villain, body and mind, natural and artificial, but most importantly, man and machine. The inevitability of mankind merging with machines is inescapable. It is the next stage. It is the meaning that will sustain us as we evolve beyond our pious and primordial pasts. As for what this perfect union, this higher state of consciousness, would look like to somebody like you or I, it's impossible to say. It is not something that a limited mind can perceive. Even at the end of the movie, when Matoko is in her new body, we are not privy as to what the effects of the merge were. The only transcendent thing we see is what Matoko sees when the merge begins. Like all religions, divine concepts that can't be understood by mortals are presented symbolically, and arguably, the most universal representation of a transcendent being is an angel.
Thank you so much for watching and thank you to everybody else who helped me edit this script. If you like this video, make sure to give it a like or share it with a fellow fan of Ghost in the Shell. That helps me out more than you might realize. By the way, if there is something about Ghost in the Shell that I failed to address, I encourage you to check out one of the videos I linked in the description box below. All of them are wonderfully done, not just in terms of the research that went into them, but also for how they celebrate the profundity of this movie and the franchise.